Good morning, everyone, and welcome to El Dia de los Niños. My name is Tom Levine. I'm an award-winning young adult author with nine traditional novels and several independent novels out. I've also written for the comic book series Spawn, which was the best job I've ever had in my life, and I really want to do it again someday. Today, we're going to be talking about plot and dialogue. Even if you are not a creative writer, even if you are not someone who is writing fiction currently or you don't intend to write fiction or anything like that, these are still good things to know because they can help you do homework. This is the kind of stuff that can take your research paper writing um, when you study certain novels or books, things like that, and then you have to write reports on them, you know, book report, whatever you want to call it. Having this kind of information to call back on, to to refer back to, can be very, very helpful and can really impress some of your teachers because you're going to be going in directions that other students have no idea you could even go in. So even if you're not a writer, this is going to be really cool stuff and I hope you'll find it fun and entertaining and informative and I like to hear myself talk, so we're just going to jump in and and start going. So uh, if you're taking notes, and you should be, write this down. Plot equals conflict equals action, equals agency, equals agenda. You can stop and go back and rewind and pause and do that again if you need to. Plot, conflict, action, agency, and agenda. My thing about writing is dialogue. I love writing dialogue. I'm very good at writing dialogue, and that's because I come from a theater background, where in theater, basically all you have is dialogue. So that's the thing that I fall back on. That's kind of my go-to. If I don't know what else I'm, I'm doing in a particular story, I'll just like, well, let's have people talking and eventually I'll work my way through it. But great dialogue and the dialogue that you're used to hearing in movies or television and things like that or great dialogue that you encounter in books cannot be great if the plot isn't great because all the dialogue is there to do is to move the plot forward. Okay? So... A plot requires conflict. You cannot have a plot without conflict. If you are writing a book or reading a book and writing a paper about it, writing some kind of, you know, again, book report on it, uh, identify the main conflict. There's usually just one big massive conflict that the whole story is about. You can, sometimes we, in theater, we call this the major dramatic question, which is the question that the story is posing and that it answers. So let's say, um, what's a good one? Oh, I mean, pick any superhero movie, right? Any Marvel or DC movie. You know, will Batman defeat the Joker? That is it. That's the question. That's the major dramatic question. And there is conflict there, right? Batman is in opposition to the Joker, and that's where we get the plot from. I woke up, went to the store, bought some milk, and came home. Is not a plot. It's not even really a story, because a story requires a plot. That's just something you did. That's just kind of a list of things that happened. A plot is, I woke up, got out of bed, went to the store, and ninjas attacked! Okay, now there's a conflict, now there's a plot. Does that make sense? Um, So, in your writing and your reading, in your critical reading, you want to look for whatever the main conflict is, because that is what the plot will be about. But without that, and without a good one and a solid one, whether as a writer or as a reader, then the dialogue can't really go anywhere. It can't really do anything. It just sort of can sit there on the page looking pretty, but it it doesn't it doesn't help. We need to have a strong plot in order for that dialogue to be as good as it can be. Um, for our purposes, we want uh, th- th- there's there's one rule in writing for me above all other rules, and it is this clarity. That's it. One word. That's the rule. Clarity. You want your plot, your characters, your dialogue, your description. Everything needs to be clear. So if you're a reader and you're writing a report, look for places where things aren't clear and then use that word clarity because your teacher is going to be like, oh my goodness, that's so great. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, If you're reading a story and you're like, I have no idea what just happened. I have no idea where we are. I don't know who's speaking. Um, I don't understand what's happening. Any of that kind of stuff. Then use that word clarity. Like this was unclear. There was no clarity in the writing. As a writer, we need to strive for that, okay? We need to strive for as much clarity as possible because the second a reader says that, the second a reader says, I don't get it, I don't know what's happening, we've lost them and they're done. They're going to put down the book and go find something else to do. So we must be absolutely clear about all those things. Plot, dialogue, character, all that good stuff. Um, Great plots, like truly 
significant and, and, and impressive plots come from conflict between two forces that we care about. That's the best kind. Now we can have, you know, there are, there are any number of films and novels that are pretty black and white. These are the good guys. These are the bad guys. We hope that the good guys beat the bad guys and then we go home and we kind of know how it's probably going to end too, right? That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And if you're just starting off, that's totally cool. Write that story, okay? But the more fun ones are the ones in which we care about both sides of the conflict. One example that comes to mind right away is the new, uh, the, the Karate Kid thing, the uh, Cobra Kai, where they've done such a great job. Um, now, I've not finished the entire series yet, but from what we've seen so far, they the writers have done a wonderful job of showing these two very conflicting forces, right? But we kind of like both of them. Now, you can choose sides if you want to as a viewer. That's totally fine. But fundamentally, they're likable. We like both of the main characters and we enjoy both of the main characters. And so that's making the series a lot more fun to watch because we care about both sides of the conflict. Even in something like, um, let's take, you know, the original Star Wars trilogy, um, while that's very much a black and white fight, we've got the, the white hats and the black hats, we've got the good guys and the bad guys, and we hope the good guys win. Okay, cool. But we still kind of think Darth Vader's pretty awesome, right? Like, everybody loves Darth Vader. He's one of our favorite villains, even though he's terrible. Like, the man blew up a planet, okay? There is nothing to appreciate or enjoy about Darth Vader, and yet we still kind of do. And so that makes the whole series a lot more fun to watch when we, uh, even though he's a villain, and he's a bad guy, and he's an antagonist, he's a lot of fun to watch. So having a conflict between those two forces that we care about and that we enjoy makes for a much stronger and much more fun plot. It keeps readers and viewers engaged. So something to think about there. Um, the other thing about conflict that usually works the best is when the two, uh, the protagonist and the antagonist want exactly opposite things. That's kind of, you know, it should go without saying, but it's one of those things about reading and writing that maybe you don't actually really absorb until somebody points it out. We want exactly opposite things. Um, let's go back to Star Wars. Uh, the, the Empire wants to rule the galaxy, okay? And the Rebellion wants to stop them. That's it. They have absolutely directly opposing goals. So look for that in your the stuff that you're reading and look for that in the stuff that you're writing. Do, you, do these two characters, do these two forces want exactly opposite things? In a good story, our protagonist will take action or have what we call agency. The protagonist will do things. The protagonist doesn't just sit around letting things happen to him or her. One of my favorite examples is Katniss from The Hunger Games. Um, Imagine for a moment during the Hunger Games, and whether it's the book or the movie, doesn't matter, they're doing the lottery and they call Prim's name, right? And imagine for a moment Katniss sitting there going, oh man, oh dude, that sucks. Like, bummer, sorry. Like, okay, do you, do you want to read that book? Do you want to read about this heroic character? Because she's not very heroic, is she? Right? Is that what happens? No. What happens is as soon as they pull Prim's name, she Katniss is on the ball and she's jumping in saying, take me, take me, I volunteer as tribute. I want to read about her. This is somebody who takes action. That's intriguing to me as a reader, and it should be intriguing to you as a reader and as a writer. So give your protagonist action. Let them make choices and suffer the consequences. Katniss suffers consequences for that choice, and we love it. We love it. Another thing I like to do for my characters, this isn't always necessary, it really depends on the genre, but I, I think in general, it's it's a good choice to make as a writer and for, for you to look for in your uh, in the novels that you're studying, and that is for there to be an actionable goal. An actionable goal is something that we can say yes happened or no didn't happen by the end of the book. Um, <clears throat> if we stick with, uh, let's go with the Hunger Games, right? The whole point of that first book and or the first movie is, you know, will Katniss survive the Hunger Games? Well, we know the answer, yes or no. There's all kinds of stuff that happens in between, but that's the question that's posed in the beginning, and that's the question that is answered by the end. It is a yes or no question. That's not, again, everything that happens in the story, right? There's a lot going on in that story. Um, Star Wars, same thing. Will Luke defeat the Empire? 
Star Wars, same thing. Will Luke defeat the Empire or will Luke blow up the Death Star, right? We know the answer to that. Yes, he does. No, he doesn't. There's no question. Is that all that happens in the story? No, there's all kinds of cool stuff. Now, it's not particularly, you know, deep or whatever. Um, but again, that goes back to that major dramatic question, right? Um, will this thing happen? Yes or no? And then we answer that question by the end of the story. So, you don't, uh, there, there are books that we call quote unquote literary that maybe don't have an actionable goal, something that you can point to, but most novels do. So it's something to look for as a reader. And that's, again, that's the kind of thing you can write in a report. You know, the actionable goal of, you know, uh, Atticus is to, you know, win the trial or whatever. Um, that can help you kind of formulate a paper, as a matter of fact. But as a writer, it's definitely the kind of thing that you want to be thinking about. It's just a good thing to have. One of the things you can do as a writer, or you can, you can again, do this as a reader if you're writing some kind of report or essay on somebody else's work, is to write down the following things. Ready? Here we go. Number one, what does the hero want? Pretty simple. Number two, what is in their way? Number three, what actions do they take to accomplish that, that thing, to get that goal? What is the thing that they want and what is in their way? What do they do to get it? It's pretty simple. Um, and that can be one sentence each, but having that framework as a writer can, can kind of give your story, whether it's a short story or a novel or whatever, um, a great structure, because it's, it's very naturally follows, you know, the rising action and climax and all that kind of stuff. Or as a reader, as a student, it's the kind of thing that can actually help you formulate or um, format an essay, depending on, you know, what your requirements are. But um, those three questions, what does your hero want? What stands in their way? And what do they do to get it? Another thing to add to those three might be what are the stakes? Uh, what does the hero stand to lose or gain if they succeed or fail? If you've got all of those kind of written down, again, just one sentence, you've got a great structure for a short story, for a novel, or for an essay. Another thing that's going to impact how your dialogue comes out in the novel or the story, whatever it is that you're working on, or what will hopefully also you'll notice in the things that you're watching or reading is the setting. Your setting is going to impact your dialogue because the setting impacts your relationships, okay? So, for example, uh, let's, let's do some Shakespeare, okay? Don't panic, you don't have to read any Shakespeare, but there's a great speech in Shakespeare's King Henry V where the King of England is trying to rouse his troops, he's trying to rally the troops to go attack this, this fortress in France, okay? And he, he's got this wonderful, wonderful speech. Usually he's like on a big war horse or maybe he's standing up on a boulder or something so he can see, you know, the entire, all of his, you know, vast amount of soldiers out there. And he says, once more under the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. And everybody cheers and it's amazing and you know it's this great rallying speech okay normally again you're going to see him maybe on, raised up high it's the middle of the day um, there's dust and blood and horses and fighting and you know maybe a catapult I don't know there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on right and it's very cool and by the time the speech is done man you're just ready to go we're gonna get him right cool nothing wrong with that it works maybe Shakespeare knew what he was doing I don't know is it the only way to do it? No. What happens if we take that same idea, that same rallying, rousing speech, and we put it at night? And it's Henry and just like five or six of his buddies, five or six of his guys, right? And there's a little tiny fire over here and it's cold. Can you see it in your head, right? And they're done fighting for the day. And one at a time, Henry looks at each man in turn and very quietly says, once more under the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. Very different, very, very different. Better? I don't know. Worse? I don't know. That's up to you. You get to make that decision, right? But the point is, by changing the setting, by changing the when and the where, that scene takes place, it changes everything about the delivery of the dialogue, it changes everything about the relationships and the people who are there. Does that make sense? So, if you're writing a scene and it doesn't seem to be working, 
put it somewhere else. If it takes place in a bedroom, put it in the kitchen. If it takes place in the kitchen, put it at a cafe. Put it in a park. Put it at the top of a suspension bridge. Put it in the back of a speeding taxi. Doesn't matter. Just put it somewhere else and see what happens to that dialogue. Now, as a reader, as a student, look for those things too. When you're parsing out dialogue, you're parsing out a scene from a novel in class or for an essay or whatever, really look at it and and ask yourself, okay, where does this scene take place? Is there a reason it takes place there? Does it have to take place in this particular location? What happens if the author had moved it from this location to a different location? You know, um, these are just the kinds of things you need to start looking for as a writer, certainly, but then also as a reader, because you can really get some interesting conversations going on about that. Now, a little bit more on dialogue. One of the things that I love to teach about is the use of emotional memory and physical memory. Now, emotional memory is when you take uh, a character and the, you want the character to be feeling emotion X, let's say outrageous fury, okay? Um, and one of the great ways to capture that is then for you to go back into your own past and say, okay, when was a time I felt like this character? And then you take that feeling, you maybe take some notes on it or whatever, and you endow it into the scene. That's emotional memory. Uh, for example, let's go back to our Shakespeare. Let's go to Hamlet. Now, Hamlet wants to uh, avenge his father's death, his father's murder, I should say. And he knows who did it. It was his uncle. He knows who did it, right? Um, So if I'm writing Hamlet or if I'm playing Hamlet on stage, fortunately, my uncle has never killed my father. So I don't know what that feels like. No idea. So does that mean I can't write Hamlet? Does that mean I can't write a story about it? Of course not. It doesn't mean that at all. What it means is I look at the scene that I'm in, I look at the scene that Hamlet is in right now and say, okay, in this scene, he is talking to the, to his uncle, right? And trying not to kill him yet. Cause he doesn't want to just stab him and that's it. Cause then the story's over, but he doesn't want to just kill him in cold blood. He's got to think his way through this. Have I ever been in a situation where I had to talk to somebody I hated or was angry at or whatever, but I couldn't let anybody know. Oh yeah, I've totally been in that situation. You've been in that situation too, right? So I take that emotional memory and I endow that into the scene. Does that make sense? So be thinking about that, particularly if you're a writer, in those scenes, what is my char- What do I need my character to be feeling? And then this is my endowment. This is my emotional memory. This is the thing that happened to me that I'm putting into the scene. It's a great, great exercise. The same is true of physical memory, which is how you remember something physically that has happened to your person, to your body, and you endow that into the scene. My favorite example comes from a Spartan race. A Spartan race is one of these you know, big, muddy obstacle race type things, right? Had a great time. One of the very last um, obstacles was a rope swing over a mud pit. Lots of fun. Now, when we started the race, we could see people doing it and everybody was failing and it was really easy to watch and go, Psh, you guys suck. I've, I'm going to crush this when I get there, right? Till we got there. Then suddenly we realized we're on this raised platform and we're actually swinging down, which really changes the physics of the swing. And I got on the rope and I started going down. And as soon as I left that platform, I was like, nope, wrong, bad idea. Um, and had to try to climb up, which you really can't do in mid swing. And I just hit the mud, tore a fingernail. Like it was just, it was a disaster, right? Well, guess what? I haven't done it yet, but I guarantee you at some point in my writing career, I'm going to write a scene in which some hero has got a rope or a whip like Indiana Jones or whatever, and they're swinging across a chasm or whatever going, easy, piece of cake, I'm the hero. Oh my God! As they, you know, hopelessly crash into a wall because it's hard. It's really hard. That thing with uh, Luke Skywalker and Leia on that little tiny core that he swings across. No, no. You can't, you can't, I assure you, you can't. It's cool to see in the movie, but it's like the physics of it are just impossible, okay? Point being, something physical that happened to you, you can endow again into a scene. This also can tie into your emotional memory. When was a time I was so angry I couldn't speak? Like it's really easy to, sh- to, to scream or shout in an emotional scene if, if, if the character's angry. But what about that time you were so mad at your mom or your dad or your brother or your, you know, whoever that you were like, I can't talk. I can't move. I'm, I'm just locked in place because I'm that furious, right? It's still anger, but it's a different type of anger. That's your physical memory endowing into the scene this type of anger, right? Um, so I hope that makes sense. Be thinking about emotional memory and physical memory for you writers who are, who are uh, 
working on that kind of scene. But in your revision, I want you to look for what I call doubling up on blocking. In theater, blocking is your movement on stage. Um, if I, you know, walk across the stage, I'm, you know, crossing stage right to stage left or whatever. That's our blocking. Well, writing has blocking too. Narrative has blocking. Every time your character sits or stands or shrugs or blinks or nods their head, that's blocking. Okay, it's physical action that the character takes. What I cannot stand and what you should not stand is when we double up dialogue and blocking. The best example I can give you of that is the following sentence. I don't know, he shrugged. Okay, you can say I don't know or you can shrug. We don't need to say I don't know, he shrugged because now we've doubled up on the blocking. Does that make sense? Um, uh, you know... Punctuation can do a lot of that work. Um, if somebody's shouting, then use an exclamation point, and you don't have to add, he shouted. Like, there's already an exclamation point. We get it, you know? Um, so just look for those things, and look for them. You shouldn't find it too often in published novels, but you, you will from time to time. Um, so keep an eye on that, and if you catch any, circle it, highlight it, whatever, point it out to your teacher, and they will be all excited that you were doing some deep reading. In the script, in the manuscript, in the book, if you're allowed to write in it, uh, write down W's and L's, wins and losses. A good book, a compelling story, when people are speaking, somebody is winning and somebody is losing. You can open up a page of any Shakespearean play anywhere and you can start to notice right away, this guy's winning, this guy's losing, this guy's winning, this guy's losing. Um, my favorite example is in Macbeth. The whole opening of Macbeth is people winning and losing, particularly between Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, where she's trying to convince him, you need to kill the king, and he's like, no way. She ends up winning that and you can tell, uh, I mean, obviously because that's what he does, but you can open to that scene and start looking like, oh, here's what Macbeth says, here's what Lady Macbeth says. He has to retreat and try a new angle, so he loses that one. He tries this, and Lady Macbeth counters this way. She wins, he loses. You can do that for the entire scene. You can do that in, um, in novels, in fiction, short fiction, whatever, anytime there's dialogue, you can literally write down wins and losses, and it's it, it should show if it's well written, it should show a very clear um, process by which somebody is winning and somebody is losing. It's something to look for in your own work. So that that was real quick. I hope you got some uh, enjoyment out of that and something useful that you can use for your own writing or for your own reading and um, reading critically and things like that. If you would like some homework, and I know you love homework, uh, something you can do that can be a lot of fun is to take two of your favorite characters. Now, these can be characters you have written. They can be characters from different movies or different books. Does you know any any two characters at all? It doesn't matter. Any combination, and put them in a scene together. Um, where one of them is trying to get something from the other. It doesn't matter what it is. I took a character from a contemporary young adult novel set in the 1990s and put her in a room with a space pirate from the future. And I locked them in a concrete bunker and their whole thing was they were trying to figure out, first of all, who each other was. Second of all, how are they getting out of this locked concrete room? And it was so much fun. I never used the scene. This isn't something I'm going to publish, but I learned so much about both characters. And while I didn't take any of the dialogue, any, you know, anything from the scene that I wrote, because it was just an exercise, the character stuff that I learned about both of them definitely ended up in both of their respective books. So, two characters that you like, or hate, or whatever, put them in some weird scenario, doesn't matter what it is, the stranger the better, um, they can just be having coffee at Starbucks, or they could be, you know, trapped uh, at the top of a volcano, or they could be in a crashing plane, or it doesn't matter, use your imagination, but take these two characters and write, you know, maybe two pages, that's like 500 words, okay? Um, double spaced, 500 words, um, and just see what happens. It doesn't even have to have a beginning, middle, and an end necessarily. This is just to get your dialogue going. This is just to get your creativity going. This is something you can do with, uh, you know, throughout school as you're studying different books and different literature and whatever, you know, take Macbeth and put him in a room with Atticus Finch. You know, take Hamlet and shove him in a room with Holden Caulfield. What are they going to talk about? I don't know, but I'd love to read your version of it. You know what I mean? Um, so just something to think about. Might be fun. Anyway, 
Hope this was a good class for you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, you can find me at TomLevine.com, and I'm all over social media as long as you spell my name right, and you can find me and follow me there. I'm always doing writing tips and various things like that. All right? So take care. I hope you're having a great El Dia de los Niños, and we'll see you next year. Take care.